five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Let's go. do this. All right. Okay, so uh, everybody, welcome to the Lucas Weaver Show. This is officially episode 1.0, and my lovely guest today is Christina Marino. Christina, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. This is so exciting. It is exciting. It's fun. You know, are, are the headphones comfortable? Everything is fine. I feel, uh, I feel good. All yeah, right. I'm set. Nice. Yeah, so we were just talking a little bit off air, um, and we were just talking about the whole audio stuff, and kind of how fun it can all be. And I was a bus boy at Outback Steakhouse when I was 16 Outback years old. Outback Steakhouse. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I remember because uh, I had a, a buddy on the tennis team who started off as a bus mm -hmm. boy and then he uh, became a waiter. And so I was applying, everybody in my like neighborhood used to go work at the grocery store mm -hmm. and they paid like 5.25, you know, an hour. And my buddy on the tennis team was like, well, Outback pays seven twenty-five. So if you can get that job, he's like, you should do it. And I got in this big fight with my mom because my mom was like, you know that that job at the grocery store is guaranteed. You uh. need to just take it. And then I went up there and they were like, yeah, you just clean tables and we pay you seven twenty-five. And I thought, all right, well, what could be, you know, that was it. That, that was in the States. That was yeah, in the States. Yeah. And it, when was this? Because I remember when minimum wage was five fifty, And my first, yeah, what, well, I had a lot of jobs um, as a teen, but I remember when I made that jump from five fifty to seven twenty five, and I was like, I'm rich. <laughs> right? I was like, I'm <laughs> yeah. rich, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I did feel richer than like all my friends. Um, yeah. You know, all my friends who were making like five something an hour, I felt like with that seven twenty five that I was, you know, a little bit better than them. Right. So, <laughs> right. Which was yeah. a, a big change actually from the way that Baller. life had always been before. <laughs> <laughs> but um but no, so once I, I made a um I took the song in the club by fifty cent and I remixed it to call nice. uh at Outback. Um <laughs> and so I just made this little theme song of being a busboy at Outback and then um put it on MySpace actually. MySpace. That was the first place I ever shared anything and uh, everybody at Outback loved it and they were always, you know, kind of um Maybe. Is it still out there? Can we? You'll have to like share it now on the channel. I mean, you can't just talk Oof, about this and would, then just. I would have to do some research. Is MySpace even still out there? <laughs> <laughs> That's the real question. But um, yeah. So I think for me, and then you know, in uh, college, I kind of made my own little recording studio at mm. home and used some student loan money on it, which wasn't too wise. But I've always been kind of in love with this audio stuff. Mm. So as soon as they put this here in the CIC, I was like, yeah. okay, I'm all over Gotta that. Check it out. Yeah. 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 So you've done a few podcasts before. You're not a rookie. I'm not. I've done. I, I've been pretty fortunate to be um, able to be on a few podcasts to share my story and what I do at She Matters. And um, I, I'm not. Um, growing up, I, I was shy. I was sort of the, the shy kid of um, of the family. And um, my mom was really the one who was the the, the talker. You know, huh. she could talk to any. She can like sell like just anything, you know, and just having chats with the cashiers at the grocery store. But, you know, I think that this kind of, when you're doing something that you're so passionate about and you really care about it and you've dedicated your life towards that, it makes talking about it easier and, and, and authentic. So I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed, you know, sharing my story and, and what we do at She Matters. So, yeah. yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so you're the founder and currently CEO of She Matters, yeah. which is an NGO still, right? No, actually, well, yes and no. We have a we have a hybrid. So we have a um, hybrid social enterprise. So we have a foundation, um, but we also have a BV, uh, a for profit company of She Matters. So they both have different functions. So for the foundation, I'm the I'm the founder and the executive director. Uh, for the BV, I'm the CEO. Okay, and so what you guys do is you guys take people who are refugees and women, especially. Yeah. So women refugees who come from all across the Middle East, mostly. They're here in the Netherlands, and they're trying to find a job. Right. They have a lot to offer, mm -hmm. um, but they face difficulties getting into the job market, and you guys help them kind of get over those obstacles. In a very broad nutshell, yes, yes. And it, it, it essentially, we our, our aim is to connect women, specifically women, uh, with employment in the Netherlands. And we do that, um, as I mentioned, through the hybrid um, um, enterprise that we have with She Matters. So the ultimate aim is just to first make, make the women feel good 
get them some workshops on soft skills, mentorship, um, look at their CV, and then and that's done through the foundation. And once they, they, they graduate that program, then they move over to the for-profit company, um, which is a recruitment agency. So the model took, uh, I've been doing this for three and a half years, and uh, it took a lot of pivoting, pivoting <laughs> a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes and picking myself up and, and moving moving forward um and yeah it just happened you know just organically so that's that's how we adopted the model did you feel when you when you made those mistakes did you have that moment where you think oh i'm such an idiot like why have i been doing it like absolutely. this for this long absolutely and you know it I, I it took a long time for me to um be okay with making mistakes because by nature i'm a i'm a perfectionist and uh um i'm also a trained lawyer so right. i you know in law school they 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 drill you to look at it, all of the small details like there's not one detail that's too small so that was like three years of law school training that just compound that with my a type personality it was really um it was really difficult to make mistakes and to own those and say you know i i, I messed up but now I, I i tell everyone who wants to listen i i make mistakes all the time <laughs> if you're looking for someone who is like perfect like you're not going to find her here because it's that's that's not what i do um i do learn from them that's the thing is i don't really um like to call them failures or mistakes i i if, if i don't extract the lessons from those mistakes or failures that's when it really is you know a failure but i'm always looking for the lesson i'm always always learning um so i can use that and move forward. Do you have any big ones that you can give to people? Any, not necessarily oh. the specific mistake, but the lesson that you learned from it? That's a good question. Oh, there's, there's so many. Um, you know, in the beginning, I think, um, it, you know, we started out as, as a foundation. Um, if I could talk about uh, She Matters, we started out as, as a foundation and um, we were incorporating some traineeships in our, in our program. And so we would work with companies for these traineeships. We don't do traineeships anymore. And um, this was a this was a hard lesson because um, the candidates that we were putting in those traineeships were excelling um, in their in their role, and um, the idea was that they would be hired for that um, right. job afterwards. And they were they were they were not the, um, they were not hired. And um, that so was, it was really, like they were being taken advantage of in a way. Is... I want to say that it was um, it's it's hard to like find like to absolutely say that right. It's yeah. it's difficult for me because um, I always want to be cautious, you know, and um, like on paper. You know, it's it's you see it, but then you experience it and you hear you. Sp I speak with the women and it's, some things just don't add up. Um, for me, that was just sort of a form of injustice. And, yeah, I guess some in some ways, you know, um, sort of uh, taking advantage of uh, the talent that the women have to offer and the skills. So that was a, that was a hard lesson. And uh, we like I said, we, we don't do those anymore. We, we focus now on on jobs. Was it a mistake? I mean. You know, yeah, looking back, I mean, I, 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 it was hard to tell, you know, again, everything's been so organic and so fluid and I'm just like, let's try this and that. Um, but yeah, you, you learn, you learn. So, so on the She Matters thing, right? Because so I would imagine that in part of your story from what I read before is you had these early moments with refugee women. Uh, one was from Afghanistan, two were from Syria. And you just kind of get in the, the first part of it's emotional, right? You kind of moved yeah. by... Um, their story, like in the situation that they're in. But then I, th I would imagine because you've worked with so many, you know, in female um, now employees that you've put into the workforce that you've also started to realize like how much talent they actually have and how much yeah. they have to offer. So at a certain point, I would imagine that it ch changes totally away from the emotional, oh, you know, I feel for these people too. Yeah. No, this just doesn't make sense. Yeah. It doesn't make yeah. sense that these people, you know, don't have jobs. Well, that actually started right off the bat because the women who I, I, I initially met in The Hague in, in summer 2017, um, they were highly skilled, highly educated. Um, one was a PhD in, in fuzzy logics. Um, I'm the most educated you can get in the States. I went through all levels of university. I'm a Juris Doctor. I still don't know what that is, like what her, what fuzzy logic was. And she tried to explain it to me. But the point is that she was, and still is brilliant, but she was, she was finding, she couldn't even get a job interview. And she had been in the Netherlands for about two years at that point. She was, you know, volunteering everywhere she could. She was taking extra Dutch language courses. And she was not able to even get a job interview. The municipality was saying, you need to, to, to get a job or we're going to cut off your social benefits. And, um, you know, she was saying to me, you know, Christian, I'm not a proud woman. I will, I will clean kitchens because that's where they're telling me I need to, yeah. need to get a job. But, you know, I was a published professor back in Syria. I traveled the world. And if you're telling me that that's all I'm good for now, you know, how would that make you feel? And of course, I, I thought to myself, not very good. 
so it was really early on that I saw it was a combination of just, you know, seeing these women, um, seeing myself in them because I, I know how it feels personally to struggle and to want a better life for yourself and your family. Um, but then also there's the, the whole, you know, social injustice, um, aspect of it, you mm-hmm. know, that this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, I, I totally understand because I think, so in my early days of, uh, teaching English here in the Netherlands, I taught a lot of refugees because mm-hmm. it was kind of at the height of the, you know, refugee crisis as yeah. far as how many people were coming to Europe, you know, just looking for somewhere to be safe. Um, and you would hear all kinds of stories, you know, that would make you think, what really yeah. people are, you know, going through this. And um, there was this one girl, her name was Zena. And I remember because um, I used to always call her Zena Warrior Princess. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and at the time, you know, her, her English wasn't very strong, but mm-hmm. you could just tell she was very smart because the questions she would ask, would, you know, sometimes you show up to teach a course and you're not 100 percent there. Maybe you're lacking a little energy, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and then somebody asks you a question, you're like, oh, I really should have already explained that. You know, that's my yeah. fault. But you can tell when people are sharp when they kind of call you on that kind of stuff. And then, you know, kind of forgot about her. It had been, I think, probably three years or something like that. And then I see her on LinkedIn and mm-hmm. she's given a speech at some, you know, like international Congress kind of thing. I think this awesome. is a, I think the speech was released like right when the first lockdown happened. Mm-hmm. Um, she had done it before. And there was just like hundreds of comments on there of people congratulating her and stuff like Amazing. that. And, and I did the same thing, of course, told her how proud I was. And, mm-hmm. But it was just like the, the thing that I realized back then, because, you know, I have a much easier situation than any of those people do. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you start to really feel for the whole immigrant situation when you actually do it yourself. And then you realize, man, so many, so many of these people have so much talent. Yeah. They're just because, from my perspective, it was the language barrier. Mm-hmm. But just because they can't speak Dutch or mm-hmm. English or whatever, mm-hmm. they just don't get to apply these skills. And yeah. there weren't, a, at the time, a whole lot of people who cared, you know? So the thing is, um, because I, I love that story. I think that um, it, it's a beautiful story, and it sounds like she's, she's heading places. So that's amazing, Zena. Um, it, the thing is, with, with me, I'm a fourth-generation Mexican-American, so I'm Latina. Um, it's ingrained in me and just the way I was raised um, that even though I was American, I was fourth, gener- I'm fourth generation Mexican American, um, my, my dad was in the military for 18 years. Um, integration was still very, very huge for my family a- in America. Um, so he didn't, we, I have uh, four siblings. My parents didn't teach us Spanish. Um, they both spoke Spanish to each other, but they were like, my, my kids are, are American. They're not Mexican. And, um, you know, that was really, um, for me growing up, like I saw, you know, I, I didn't, it didn't, still doesn't make sense sometimes, you know, when I think about that, but at the same time, it's like, I get what they're saying is, you know, because the color of our skin, you know, my, my parents wanted us to have a better opportunity from what like they had or like their parents had. So our, our names are like, Christina, Cindy, Joshua, they're not like Lupe and Maria, you know, it's very, you know, and again, it's like sometimes I, I, I was like, you know, because language is part of your identity, right? And, yep. and but, um, but um, to sort of tie this into what I do here and the stories that I, that I hear, I understand the value of someone trying to make it in a country, in a new country. Yep. And um, that will go, that will last generations, right? And so that is part of my life. And I, I think in America, we're more, I think, um, adept to understanding the value that immigrants have towards a new country, you know, and, and that's for me was just kind of like, yeah, you know, we're, we're a melting pot in the States, you know, but in the Netherlands, it was completely different. It still is completely different. Um, and that's part of the, what I saw in 2017 when I met the women in The Hague. And I did research and I found out that only 11% of uh, newcomers were employed. You break that down even more for women, it was only 4%. Um, and, and, and again, so it was like, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm, I'm, I, again, coming from America and I'm, I'm Latina and, you know, I see how hard my family worked, my grandparents worked to have, for their children to have a better life. They're just hardworking. And then meeting the women here, they're talented, they're skilled, but they're unemployed. Very strange. It's, yeah. I, I think, you know, it's, it's also kind of a shame, though, because the same situation is going on in the United States. It's mm-hmm. just different that maybe like uh, one of the, I think, biggest misconceptions about Syrian refugees, especially, is that because somehow if you come from Syria and you're a refugee, you're supposedly poor. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, Syria was mm-hmm. a very wealthy country <laughs> before you. the Civil War, you know? Yes. And 
So a lot of these people, I think, you know, yes. they have great education. They have, you know, great backgrounds. Like they, they are very talented and very skilled. And I think that's probably the key difference from the economic refugees that, you know, come to the United States, yeah. maybe from South America. And some of them are not only economic refugees, but you have like these terrible situations in Nicaragua and places where it's just so dangerous, I think, to even live. But at the same time, it's still somebody who's who has the spirit. They're willing to work. Mm-hmm, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's almost as if like you know people for. So there's this analogy about steroids, right? That everybody thinks like you can just magically inject yourself with steroids and then you get huge. They mm-hmm. forget that you still have to lift a lot of really heavy weights. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And I think one of these things that people often overlook when they talk about people taking jobs and stuff like that is people actually still have to work the jobs. People are still out in yeah. fields. They're in yeah. bathrooms. Yeah. They're in kitchens like you talked about. Yeah. And it's not easy. And these people are proving. So you might have been an undocumented worker for 15 years and you committed one crime, which was coming here illegally. But then for the rest of that time, you worked your ass yeah. off, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the same time, you mentioned something interesting about kind of the multiculturalism, right? Mm -hmm. Because you said that your family was big on, you know, gave you Christina names and then um, basically like didn't teach you Spanish, stuff like that. And to me, that's I say the exact same thing here all the time is that this idea that, you know, where people come and they basically set up like a whole new Turkish community Mm -hmm. and all the kids like they watch Turkish movies, they listen to Turkish music. They don't really ever become Dutch. Integrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They would never call themselves Dutch. But in the U.S., it's totally different because especially I think when I was a kid it seemed like racial tensions for at least like people when I was young, Mm -hmm. it was much lower than it is, has been recently, Mm -hmm. right? I didn't really think like, okay, if you're black or you're this or you're that, you're not American. It was Mm -hmm. basically, do you watch the Disney Channel? What's your favorite football team? You know, do you like hamburgers kind of thing? If all those boxes were ticked, you were, we're all Americans, you know? And, And you, and I do think that that's one of those things that's a difficult topic because for some people they say, no, like a kid should be allowed to have Spanish as their first language and still feel American. And I don't, don't feel any problem with you know us learning more languages because we really should we're so yes. behind <laughs> but at the same yeah. time I, yeah. I really do think that that not having multiculturalism and having a shared yeah. identity of being American is a strength yeah I think um, that that's a good point I mean it's um I mean, it's complicated, right? Because, like, you know, my family, I have family in California. Like, you know, we have something called the barrio, you know, where, like, it's, like, these neighborhoods where, you know, it's um, really, like, you know, Mexican, uh, you know, families there. And I think, you know, you also see that here. You mentioned, like, the Turkish or, you know, like, the Moroccan community. I think um, there's a couple things going on that, you know, people, when they get to a new country, they want to have some sort of familiarity, you know, with people who... Uh, maybe look like them or speak that same language. I know for me, when I came here from the United States, first thing I did was like look at like some American expat groups, you know, because I kind of wanted to feel at home. You know, it was kind of a culture shock for me. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, so it's always like you know I can understand you know that there's um, you know these sort of these pocket of pockets of communities um, in the Netherlands, and um, you know the thing is is that you know it's um, I think you need to break that break that down I think we see that more here I think than in the United States because you're right like you know English you know like um, that's that's sort of that's that's the language Um, integration you know it's like okay try to you know get into like certain like I don't know uh, neighborhoods and let's not have it so um, centralized you know having like these these smaller communities but in order to do that you need a society that just opens up to them and accepts them right and will be and will see them not as the other or you know threatening and and that's difficult I think that's difficult yeah and it's not exactly yeah you're right and and I don't want to make it sound like you know the U.S. is some like fairy tale wonder wonderland, you know. Because I'm from Texas, so you know we have a lot of. Where are you from in Texas? I'm from East Texas, a East? town called Lufkin. Okay, it's about two hours north of uh, Houston. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so we have a lot of people who you know came from Mexico and a lot of other you right. know South American yeah. places, yeah. and and you do you hear a lot of that negative talk because. I think what oftentimes happens is like you have these these people who aren't really supported, right? Mm-hmm. So then they do also kind of make their little, you know, people call it Little Mexico or something like that, yeah. these neighborhoods where, you know, they'll all live and they know they can be safe because then they're not really, you know, going to have to deal with people kind of harassing them and stuff right. like that. But you're right. They are treated as outsiders. So then they, they play soccer, right? And then 
then the soccer team is like all kids of people who came from Mexico. Yeah. And so then it's like they, they find ways, places that they can succeed and places where they can be comfortable because it's not exactly like the baseball teams full of white kids are inviting yeah. Mexicans to come, you know, play on the yeah. team. So, yeah. but it is like, just like you said, when you move here from the U.S., you need kind of, you want to feel like you belong in a yeah, way, exactly. even if you're not from there. Exactly. And I think that belonging is difficult for, for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to kind of, you know, break through. And um, I think also for the women who I support, it's um, there's also this sort of um, identity shift that we're seeing with with them. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I I know a woman who I met. I think in the the first year, you know, I was getting to know her story, and she was saying how back home in, in, in Syria, which by the way, you're absolutely right. It you know, people have this idea of you know, if you come from Syria, you're you're you know, poor, or, you know, marginalized. Um, Damascus University used to be one of the best in the world, yep. and pe- people don't don't know that. Um, and and when I was speaking to this woman, she was telling me her story and told me how how wealthy she was. And I've heard that that was the first time I, I had heard that, and I've heard it uh, uh, quite a few times after that. And so, you know, back home, she was she was wealthy. She was a professional. She she worked. Her family was wealthy. And now she has nothing. She's now in the Netherlands, and she's now on outgearing, which is uh, essentially social social welfare. Mm. And she f- has all of these emotions of you know shame, confusion. You know, I you know saying you know Christina, I had to leave my money there. I couldn't take it with me, and now I have nothing. I have to now ask for money from the government, something that they've never had to do before. You know, so it's it's um, the sort of this uh, shift in, in their identity. And when they get to the Netherlands, yeah, they they do want to find you know these pockets of uh, community where they can um, be amongst people who have that same experience, you know, and, and they can share and they can learn and they can laugh. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, like I listen sometimes, I put on my my um, my music and, and sometimes, this, and this is music I haven't heard it in years, but it's like cumbia. And we, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, cumbia, yeah. Oh, there's some people around here that'll play some cumbia. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's okay. I gotta really find them. For it. But like that, those, like that, that you know, um, shared experience of just like music, it sort of takes you back to like your, your roots or like where you come from. You know, and I, I totally get it. Um, but I, again, at the same time, you know, they're 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 trying to push through. I had a, another woman tell me when I was getting her a job, I had to ask for her passport um, and her identification for for the for the job. And she said to me, and it, it really broke my heart, Christina, um, can you wait another month because I'm getting my Dutch passport? And I, I don't want to give them my Syrian passport because they're going to know I'm, I'm a refugee. Ugh. Can you please just wait a month? And I just, I cried, yeah. I cried, and I, I gave her the biggest hug, and I said, you have nothing to be ashamed about. Yeah. You have nothing to be ashamed about. So it's so multifaceted, I think, you know, the the, the journey that they're going through. And I used my example earlier of, of you know, uh, being for fourth generation Mexican-American, I, I could not ever, and I never pretend that I can understand their journey because yeah. God knows I can't. I was raised in, you know, several military bases. You know, I was pretty much, you know, I was, we were, you know, protected. We didn't have to worry about, you know, um, survival, yeah. you know, it, 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 um, you know, from like, you know, traveling and, you know, all of, all of the things that come with it, uh, migrating. But um, no, they, they, they've really, um, yeah, they, they've shown me a lot, so much. Yeah, I can only imagine. I, I feel mm-hmm. like it has to be such a rewarding job to have. Like, not only I think having your own startup, which is always for me cool. I think because it's it's the freedom, it's the growth, it's all those things. But then to have that kind of you know impact to go along with it, you know, for lack of a better word, that you just all these real people in yeah. real lives that you come in contact with it's a it's just got to be something that kind of feels rich you know well I think um so entrepreneurship is one thing um you know it's it's hard it's hard and anybody who tells you that it's not they're they're, they're lying they're they're lying <laughs> That's your yeah, okay there. they're lying um <laughs> they, because um it really is um it, it is so much work um yes. and, and I unpaid work a lot of <laughs> absolutely hours and hours and uh before COVID hit and I was um speaking at um, um different venues I would go to university and I would get this question a lot is, you know, um, I have an, I have an idea. I'm thinking about being an entrepreneur. Um, can you tell us about your experience? And I, I always tell them, look, unless your idea is you're, you're willing to fall down, you're willing to go without sleep, 
um, consume coffee like crazy, um, get rejected. You have to handle reject. I've been rejected more times on this journey the last three and a half years than uh, like I, I have my whole entire life. Um, you have to love your idea and be willing to fight for it. Mm-hmm. So because She Matters has that social aspect, social impact aspect um, built into it, that is what I fight for, you know, and, and that's, that's what keeps me going and that's what makes me get up every morning and fight harder even though I got rejected or I made a mistake yeah, or whatever yeah. it's always with that goal in mind like I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going I'm gonna go as long as as, as I can and I don't know what's going to happen you know we, we're out now in a world with COVID you know and who knows what the you know economic impact will will be we're still kind of finding that out you know yeah but I'm just going to keep going as We're long as I can. still not finding it out. We're still yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Crazy. so what do you think it is within you that kind of drives you to do that? Because I almost feel like you have to be a little crazy to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't make any sense. I once sat down and calculated it. it. If I would have kept my English teacher job mm-hmm. three plus years ago before I started Weaver English, I would have made way more money. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense, but yet we do it no. because that's like something. Ins- what do you think it is inside you that... It's such, a, it's such a good question. I was on the phone with my um, uh, my best friend who's an entrepreneur in Rotterdam, and um, he was telling me, he's he's been in the game for, I think, 10 years. So he's now at the point where he's selling his company, but something, uh, he had, there was a hiccup, and he's, he, you know, he's working on it. And um, he, we sometimes lift each other up, and we kind of, we have to laugh at some point because we have the same question towards each other. What makes us do what we do, you know, to, to work all of these hours most of them unpaid, definitely the beginning unpaid. Uh, what makes us, you know, um, um, you know, push and push and keep going um, despite just sort of like that, you know, current coming back at you and pushing you back. And I think the answer for, for, for me is um, I, I wanted, for me, um, I look at like the bigger picture um, and that has to do with gratitude and, and happiness. It sounds so cliche. It, it sound it, it, it does. Um, but for me, this, um, I was sort of going through this moment in my life three and a half years. No, um, actually four years ago bef- um, before it started She Matters. And it was maybe an existential crisis. <laughs> but I was just at a point where like, okay, I went through all levels of university. Check. I uh, moved to the Netherlands and I'm now practicing international law check. Um, I have this beautiful apartment in Skavening, a check. Um, but I wasn't happy, you know? So yeah. all of the things that society says, okay, you need in order to be happy. I was like, I, I'm not feeling that. And it was when I would think I was browsing Instagram, I saw a photo, um, and there was a photo taken from a grave and there was like the dirt walls and the looking up, you see the sky. And there was some text in the middle that said, if you were to die today, what impact would your life have? Mm. And I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with the answer I, for, for myself. Right. Right. That, that, yeah, that, and I, me a little. <laughs> yeah, it really was, um, um, life changing to see, to see that and, and to think about it, you yeah. know, and have, and just be honest with yourself. And when I made the decision, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy. I know I'm not, and I want to be happy because as far as we know, I mean, reincarnation, maybe. You only get one life. I heard life. you in your previous podcast, you said like two or three times, like, we only have one life that we know of. <laughs> I, 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 like, you know, I don't want to get like, like comments. we got to talk about like, that. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. People be like, um, actually, I, I don't know. I, you, I mean, who knows? Who but knows? I mean, come on. There's a huge percentage of the world's population that believes you get more than one life. So I don't think it's ridiculous to say okay. you think that you do. <laughs> We may, maybe we get it. Like, I, I, if I were, were to ever be reincarnated, I would love to come back as like a beloved dog. I Ooh. would. Uh, that's like. That's like. I, I, or a panda. Pandas are great. I could yep. totally be a panda. Yep. And they're dangerous. Nobody fucks with pandas. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love pan. I mean, either a dog or a panda. But for me, it's like right. I'm gonna focus on now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put all of my energy towards making an impact. And even if it was just for one person, at the time when I made the decision, I was like, that's the right thing to do. And then it was just like the universe just really got out of my way because mm. I made that decision and everything fell into place after that. So that was like, I think between like January and I think April, I was sort of, you know, thinking, having, having this idea. Um, June, I, I, I spoke at an event. Um, that's how I met the three women in The Hague. They, they had approached me. And then I started She Matters in August 2017 and all the pieces came together. I'm someone who, um, I am spiritual. I mean, I grew up re- religious. Um, I believe that if some, if you make a decision 
right? If you set your heart to something, that's your path. Like everything, universe will get out of your way. And that's what's happened to me. So it actually guides all the decisions that I make as an entrepreneur because if I make a decision to go on a path and I see it's it's things aren't working out, boom, boom, boom. Okay, this isn't our path. So it's Pivot. like that definite purpose. You mean, once you have that definite purpose of this is what I'm going to do, yeah. it's just a matter of time and how it happens. Now, all of a sudden, all those little moments of trying to just, oh, do I do this or should I do that? It, it all gets a little bit easier, you're it, saying? Uh, yeah, it all gets, it, because you have to make a decision, right? And it's like, you know, and you feel it. You just kind of feel like um, that that's what you're supposed to be doing. Another thing I believe is that everybody was born with gifts. Mm. So I can't be Lucas. I can't do what Lucas does. I don't, don't have your... <laughs> I, even if I wanted to, I couldn't because you have your own gifts that I was, they're just not inherent in me. Yeah. I have my own gifts that are n- could, not, in, right? I'm nowhere near as detail oriented <laughs> as you are. So I, it's, it's, that's not a gift actually. <laughs> it's bad. But, um, and that's what I tell the women, you know, in, in my program, because they're, they feel sort of this pressure to integrate in the Netherlands and in, you know, in the company that they're, that they're at. And for me, I try to tell them, look, you're authentic. You know, those are gifts. Don't feel that you have to, um, remove those, you know, to, to, in order to blend in that's, you are unique and you have something to offer that no one else specifically, no one else in this world can, can be or do what you do. And so for me, that's, um, you know, knowing that and feeling like, right, I make, I made a decision. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go this direction. Yeah. If it feels good, it, it, that's how it starts. And then things start to fall into place. Again, I know the opposite where if I make a decision, it just kind of like doesn't sit right, you know, and just, mm, but I, it just makes sense. I should go here. And then you go there and things don't work out. Yeah. That's not my path. All right. So you've brought me yeah. now to a, a fascinating question that I want to ask, which is a lot of people, it was very common, right? When you look at say new year's, you mm-hmm. know, you have a lot of people who let's say December 28th, you know, this year it's, I'm going to change, you know, I'm going to yeah, be different. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the gym actually this year and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, um, a lot of people, it's, it's common for them to kind of make these mental proclamations and mm-hmm. say, this is, this is going to change. And you're talking about how, you know, with entrepreneurship, um, you, you have to kind of make that stand where you say, no, this is, this is the way that it's going to be. Because if you're halfway in, you're halfway out. It's never going to work. You're not going to feel good. Like, you're going to lose money when you start a business, mm-hmm. okay? In the beginning, for sure. Um, you're going to lose a lot of time. You're going to have a lot of stress. A lot of these things are going to happen, and there's no way around any of that. And the only way that you're okay with it is if you're definitely committed to this thing that yeah. I'm going to do. If you're halfway in, halfway out, you're just going to drop it. You're going to, oh, lose money. I can't lose money. So you just kind of panic and whatever. However, a lot of people, you know, I, what I want to get to is, so you were, uh, I think it was, you were 18, right? Mm-hmm. And you, be- this mm-hmm. before law school, right? That. So before you go to law school mm-hmm. and then you have the government worker who tells you, you say, I want to be mm-hmm. a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And they mm-hmm. say, uh, oh, you know, good luck. Keep dreaming. Mm-hmm. Um, and they tell you to like apply at Walmart or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So you say that that was a big shift for you. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. you say, no, OK, I can be a lawyer. This is what I want to do. And so, you mm-hmm. know, I'll let you tell that story of kind of how that happened. But what I want to really know is what was the difference between you actually saying then, no, I'm going to become a lawyer when up until that point, you know, it's nothing would really lead that government worker to believe that you actually would be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. What, what kind of, you know, shift did you make or what was that the key that actually allowed you to really just change your entire life from that point on? Yeah. So you're talking about, um, the, um, probably the first big pinnacle moment that I had in my, in my life. And that was meeting with my caseworker, with my, my son on my lap. And, um, in the United States caseworkers, like if you're on welfare, they want to make sure that you're, you know, finding a job. And she asked me what I wanted, um, as my career. And, um, really as like, as a kid in the United States, I think, you know, being American, you, you're like in elementary school, you're a fifth grade. Okay. You have to go up in front of the class. What do you want to be when you grow up? Right. And it's usually like astronauts or like veterinarians or president of the United States. And then um, I had me, that one for sure. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, it was like one of the, like, there's like these big professions. And for me, it was like a lawyer. And uh, I remember it was like, um, it was a D, it was very specific. I, I wanted to be a district attorney. I didn't have From any law and order idea. or what? I had no idea what that was. I mean, again, I was like maybe 10. I was like 10 years old or something. And I was like, yeah, it sounds important. And I'm going to be that. Um, so, I, you know, growing up, I sort of like, like, right, I learned more about it. It's like, I like to argue. <laughs> I like this is perfect for me, you know, and like um, there was a sort of also this prestige about being a lawyer, you know, like you, you as I was growing up and, it, you know, my teens I was like, oh, that just again, it sounds important. Yep. So like for me in the United States, you know, becoming um, a mom at um, um, 16 years old, um, 
having my son so so young and then having nothing you know dropping out of um, out of high school and um you know being on being on bel- welfare i felt ashamed i felt like this isn't my life because i knew i wanted to be a lawyer like such a contrast between like what in my mind i was going to be and but now i have nothing my my son is you know i'm, I'm trying to prevent him from walking on the carpets in the welfare office because they're dirty i felt out of place you know and um um so so for her to tell me like what was possible for me i wasn't willing to accept that i wasn't willing yeah. to accept like okay she doesn't know me i see her maybe once every other month or something um for her to, to to like laugh and say like you don't belong up here you need to stay down here um something didn't sit right with me and i actually got angry at her and um and i i think at that moment i was just like i'm gonna prove you wrong i'm gonna prove myself that I can do it, but I'm going to prove you wrong. And, um, yeah, it it took over 10 years for me to, you know, um, at the time I had, um, I didn't even have my GED. I I had to go uh, take some courses to get, to prepare for the exam. I got my GED. I enrolled in a community college and I was still taking high school level courses to even be getting into like college level. I took like a year and then earning my associate's degree, like transferring to the university for my bachelor's. I I had a major and a minor, um, my master's degree and then law school. The thing is that the case work. Yeah, that's a a lot of schooling. Right. But I was also working full time at the call center. So it was it. But then that's the thing is the caseworker wasn't the first person who who um, told me that I that I couldn't reach that dream. Right. So like at the call center, my routine is like I would, you know, drop my son off at daycare and then I go to um, to work and I would do my homework in between um, calls, you know, and um, because I had had, at school at night and there would be, you know, like my colleagues or even my boss the director would uh, at this call center would say, yeah, what, what are you studying? And I would, you know, I was really proud, like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer. And they all, most of them said the same thing, you know, it was just like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. And I, I, it, get, it got to the point where I stopped telling people about my dream because yeah. I knew what are the what are the chances that I would actually be a lawyer. Right. I started to realize like yeah, that's a big gap. Like even to get into law school, it's really competitive. But I'm so I kind of I I just kind of would laugh it off, and eventually I stopped telling people what what my plans were. Um, and it's really funny now because um, you know I, I I still have um, on social media I have a lot of great friends um, who I used to work with who um, you know. Um, tell me how proud they are of me or all oh, I remember, you know, when you're studying, you know, and, and you know, how look you, you've made it. I, I feel so proud. I should, feel so proud. So yeah, your, your question was, uh, what, what, yeah. How did you actually do it? Because all those people who said that probably yeah. saw many people in their lives who said, Oh, I'm going to go be a doctor and then <laughs> nothing. And then the next person, Oh, I'm going to go be a, uh, you know, actor in Hollywood and then nothing. But then you, you know, so I don't yeah. really think that that lady was actually, like you said, she didn't know you very well, yeah. but at the same time, she probably saw a lot of people who are like that. And she's just wanting them to say, Hey, how about you, you know, crawl Real, before you can walk yeah. kind of thing. Now she could have probably been a lot better in the way <laughs> that she did it, but I want to know what made you different. Like, what was it that how did you actually yeah. do it? Because basically, yeah. like you say, from then on, you just worked your ass off. Yeah. But it sounds like you were just, you knew, it, you already were smart enough and you already knew that it was possible. And then for that lady to just, you know, look in your face straight in the eye and say that it's not, it almost sounds like you're kind of, that part of you that loves justice and like hates inequality and stuff like that Absolutely. was really set off. And you're like, no, 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 I'm going to show you. Yeah. Oh, that's no, yeah. Again, like we're getting really, really um, deep into it because no one's really, really asked about this before. Um, not really, and you know, sometimes I, I think about that, and because I think there's a really like a common thread with um, Christina then and Christina now as an entrepreneur. Mm. Why do I keep going? Why do I keep yeah. going? And even same question from before, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's you know, um, even some of my advisors, you know, when when things don't work out, you know, they're um, they're there to keep me grounded, you know, and to to just you know check in every now and then. Christine, are you is this worth it? You know, is this yeah. worth it? And for me, I think you know, it, it's it's a common thread. You're absolutely right. There's this there's this aspect of um, social justice that just as a kid, I always um, if there was a kid getting picked on, doesn't matter if it was um, a boy or a girl, I I, I would like. Jump Jump in. I would just, I would, I, I hated seeing that. I hated um, seeing, you know, kids getting bullied. Yeah. That for me was like, it, it just, um, um, it's in my nature just to sort of stick up for people. 
Um, but I think, you know, uh, growing up, I was a quiet kid, but I don't know. I always, I, I had a bigger vision for myself, I think, at, even at a young age. And um, I had a, I felt that my purpose, I didn't know what it was, but it's a feeling you get that you're meant to be in a certain place, you know, yeah. like, uh, now keep in mind, people have choices. Like I, f- I feel that there's sort of a fork in the road that people have going back to what I said about people having their gifts. Mm-hmm. You can either, you can either use those gifts. You can either decide to go on the path where you're going to use those gifts and that you're going to make, you know, the, the, the you're going to leave your mark on the world or you're going to go the opposite direction and you're going to do what your family says or like what society says. So for me, again, it was like looking at the conversation with the caseworker. It was like, um, what, what path do I, do I want to go on this? And again, this is very identical with my path that she matters. Um, this is the more comfortable path, the path on the right, mm-hmm. being a lawyer, uh, making good money, working on great cases, but not happy, not fulfilled. Yep. This is the path that is dirty. It's raw. It's, <laughs> um, tiring. It's, um, stress inducing. It's, you know, uh, all these things, but I'm much more happier here. I don't know what the hell I'm doing sometimes. And it, feels like you're walking but the floor is going to come out from under you at any moment that's my experience of entrepreneurship but it feels good it feels good and again it goes back to the social justice like I'm gonna um because there's injustice here and it's not right I'm gonna do what I can to make it not completely right right because this is a big issue but I'm gonna I can control what I do in my own space and I'm gonna try I'm Mm -hmm. gonna try and if I didn't try that would have been the biggest regret looking back at my life when I'm like 80, like, oh, I wish I would have tried. That would have been the worst. Maybe you just answered this, but so um, in your kind of entrepreneurial Mm -hmm. journey was, and you talked about how the, the, I guess, kind of uh, material things weren't really making you happy. And for the uh, American viewers, uh, Skaveningen is a very nice beach town in the Netherlands. So if you're not happy living there, there are, of course, more (laughs) southern beaches in Europe that might be a little better weather. But at the same time, it's a a beautiful uh, beach town, great place to live. Um, so you weren't happy there. You weren't happy with a lot of these things. Um, was there kind of this moment where, because I think everybody, when they get into entrepreneurship, you have this idea of what you think entrepreneurship is and how you think you're supposed to feel. And then if you, yeah. you at a certain point have to kind of make a switch and figure out what is, why am I actually doing this? And I'll just, and you just got to be honest with yourself. If it's to be on TV, you want to be famous, then you just got to be honest with yourself and then go mm-hmm. after that. But if it's something else, um, so I, what I wonder is from you, like, did you kind of, and you were just talking about the making a difference part of it, which I think, of course, everybody's first reaction when you hear mm-hmm. like, but I, I honestly think when you do start working with refugees, you start working in the social impact space, like it is a very, you know, fulfilling uh, thing. Um, so I just wonder, you know, for you, did you, was there a moment when you kind of were just honest with yourself and said, this is, if I'm going to be putting in this many hours, drinking yeah. this much coffee, pulling out this much hair, this is what I want to get out of it. If not, I'm gonna, not going to do it anymore. Yeah, but the the answer is I had no clue, no <laughs> clue what my um, journey would look like. Um, when I started She Matters a week after I uh, like registered She Matters with the Chamber of Commerce, um, our application for TEDx Amsterdam Women was accepted, and from there our profile, my my profile in particular, just skyrocketed. Um, I was thrown into this world of entrepreneurship. I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, I, I'm not an MBA. I didn't go to business school or anything like that. Like, at my, by trade and training, I was a lawyer. So now to be in this space and to be amongst, like, entrepreneurs, that was so new to me. And, um, again, going back on, like, Instagram, I would, like, you know, hashtag, you know, oh, entrepreneur, Instagram. hashtag, you know, f- uh, female entrepreneur. I would see these women, and I now I know it's 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 BS. They were on their bed and they were like, you know, with their hair just kind of coiffed and, you know, they were like, you know, working with like their MacBook and they had like a croissant and some orange juice like on the side. And, you know, it's appealing when you like look at those. You're like, oh, this 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 looks good because not only can I like work on my, you know, passion, but, you know, I don't have to answer to anybody this is my idea and like you know I can work whenever I want to I could take weekends off I can take evenings off uh-uh mm-hmm. uh-uh so so that's the thing is um I I left my job uh, I left my career in law in March 2018 what was your uh, legal specialty or 
Uh, international human rights and um, humanitarian law and criminal law. So it's a perfect setup for what you're doing now. But yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I, 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 I really liked, and I actually have a minor in human rights. There's something about about that really in- interested me. So um, you know, that's that's what I was doing. You know, in in my work, and I worked really hard to get in that space. But you know, I I left my job, I left my career, and I took out my savings, and I just threw myself in into it. And the thing is, and I think this is my character I can now say this now is um, I'm somebody who yeah I, I take calculated risks um, but I had no clue what my um, my life would look like when I left my career when I downgraded from that beautiful apartment in Skaveninga I moved <laughs> in with a, uh, an elderly couple in The Hague and I was uh, that's commitment right uh, there <laughs> I was 37 years old and, um, and I, I moved in you know this small room with like this little small like bathroom with someone else's parents not even yeah, your parents I know <laughs> like, who, who does that it was like I, you know for me it, it, again it just it just felt good um, what I do it would I do it over again if I knew then how my journey would look like with everything I just described with the setbacks, the rejections, the failures? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that this has been one of the, the, the most difficult journeys of my life, mm-hmm. but it's also been one of one of the most rewarding. And um, the, the women who I meet they have changed my life and I, I would do it all over again. Of course, I, I do things differently knowing what I know now, but I, I would do it all over again. Do you still have imposter syndrome? Not anymore. Um, now that's also another good question because I, I did in the beginning. I did um, um, I, I, to go back what I said about uh, TEDx Amsterdam Women. I remember walking in. Um, our application was accepted for for the startup pitch award, and out of eighty eight applicants um, in the Netherlands, I was selected to be to pitch. I think it was like down to twenty. Um, and I and I walk into um, the circle in Amsterdam, and for me, and I had like my like what you think a lawyer looks like, like that was that was me on my blazer on, you know, and I, I look like a lawyer. I, but I walk in, and for me, it was like seeing there were 19 other women in the room, and they were all entrepreneurs and uh, the be- the best, uh, you know, in, in startups in the Netherlands. And I remember looking at them and thinking. I don't belong here. Mm. I don't belong here because you know they, they for me it was a combination of they they look confident, yeah. but they also for me it was like they're beautiful. Like these are Dutch women, and like you know I don't look, I don't feel like I belong here. I don't know what I'm talking about. What is a business model? I'm serious. That was my that was my thing. I had I had prepared. It was I was supposed to give a one minute pitch. Oof. Oh, that was tough. so tough. That was Man. so tough. But I, so I went in and there's actually a video online on uh, their channel and uh, you can see me and I, I, I look calm, I look calm and I'm just, you know, and I'm clapping, but I'm actually texting my girlfriends and there's a, a shot of me, you know, uh, texting and I'm just, and I'm telling them this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> this <laughs> is going to be a disaster. Cause I was like, the, they, they split up the groups in like two. So I was supposed to go like in the second group. And so I'm watching these, these women again, who look beautiful and confident and I'm, they're like, nailing their pitches and I'm just this is gonna they're gonna laugh at me I need like try to find the back door like I'm gonna see when the, when there's a break I'm gonna leave and they were just like no you're staying there you're staying this you know you're you're, you're gonna you're, you're gonna do this um I went up there and I gave my pitch and I was the only one who got a, a standing ovation in my Aww. in my pitch and um you know so but in the beginning I had like this very big imposter syndrome you yeah. know like you know yeah I'm a CEO yeah right do they you know they no way if they knew how much how little I know you know like this is I'm a fraud you know they, they no way um but I think that I've earned the confidence that I have now because of the mistakes and the the the, the, the decisions I've made um I own that title through and through and I, I I am proud of myself with you know everything that I've done it to that point but that you know it, it took a lot of um yeah I didn't it didn't come natural for me to feel confident and to be to own my my space you said you know you walked into that room and you saw 20 women or yeah. whatever it was and uh there was something in one of your you know previous interviews when you talked about um basically feeling like um you were being pushed in this direction or told this is like the class level you're supposed to be in. This is the type of job you're supposed to be. And I thought about that from the perspective of women, like Mm -hmm. let's say going into a networking event. 
Um, and let's say that, you know, if it's in finance or something like that and you walk in and it's nine out of every 10 people are men and mm -hmm. you're a woman, mm -hmm. can you talk about maybe what is the effect on women when you are constantly outnumbered? Because it seems like w w the point that you made was that like, there's this message that's reinforced to you that you don't really belong here. Mm -hmm. This is for men, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of times this is for white men, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. can you maybe, yeah, talk about how, what effect that has on female entrepreneurs and, and women in, f in male dominated industries that kind of makes you feel like there's this subliminal message that you don't belong there. Yeah, but I'm going to go a little bit further. I'm going to talk about like gender, but I'm also going to talk about race. Sure, go Be for it. Because um, I'm, I'm thinking about my, my time in law school. So in my class, there were only four Latinos in the in the class of 100. I was one of them. Um, and primarily the, 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 um, my, the fellow students were white men. Um, it, and, you know, we had, uh, yeah, there was still a disparity in terms of like the, um, you know, the difference between, you know, men and women there. The women were a smaller number, but even breaking that further, like I walked in another moment of feeling like I don't belong here was walking into orientation and just seeing in, um, in, in, in Idaho, um, seeing, um, an auditorium full of mostly white men. Mm. A lot of white um, men in Idaho, for a sure. Lot of, <laughs> a lot of white, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, it, it was in the in the first year. Um, it was a struggle, I think. Um, law school. I mean, first year of law school is, is hard. They really. I remember the and this is a kind of a cliche, but the dean of the law school on orientation said, "Look to your left, look to your right. Yeah, yeah. One of you will not be here at, at the end of three years." And he was right because I, I I lost some friends. Um, they they didn't they didn't pass. Um, R.I.P. The, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> It, it it was uh, it was true and it's hard the first year they, they really kind of break break you down and how like you think and I'm grateful I can use that experience of my, you know being an entrepreneur but um, it was difficult to um, um, yeah to 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 fit in I think you know in, in the sort of this male dominated sector it still is the legal profession is is primarily dominated by, by men it, it's getting better um, but again you break that down even more and then you know to be a minority in um, in this this space you know I remember feeling like um, I wonder if they think that I got here because of affirmative action. Mm. I wonder if they think, and for those who don't know, affirmative action is a policy that um, is implemented in the United States. Funny enough, we don't. There's not a similar um, policy in the Netherlands. But in order to um, equal out the, you know, it, universities, for example, there's sort of a quota system that universities have, you know, to um, to integrate, you know, minorities into the class. Um, and I. I mean, I applied, um, I, again, like, I feel like I've, a lot of women say a lot, um, I got lucky. Mm -hmm. I never say that. I worked my butt off to get into Good law school. You. I worked my butt off and I, I knew that like, I, I earned that spot there, mm -hmm. but still it couldn't help but think, I wonder if they think that I got here because of affirmative action. So there was kind of like this pressure to, um, when you're called on in, in, in class to, you know, get the answer right you know, and to, to show up on time and, you know, to work harder because there's, you know, this feeling like, you know, there's, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't look like them. My parents aren't judges or lawyers. Like I don't have anybody in my family who's a lawyer. Um, but I'm, I'm here because I want to be here and I deserve the spot that I, that I got. So I don't know if that answers your, your, your question, but, um, I'm not sure. I was listening very closely and forgot my question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was, a t it, was a, it was about women, um, you know, being basically, in a, yeah, about yeah. that whole thing of um, the like this, the way that the structure is, mm -hmm. it almost seems like it's, you don't, people don't think about this stuff, right? We're especially pre me too movement, you know, everybody just thinks this is liberal, you know, horseshit basically. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I mean, you have to think about the psychological factors that it's so funny that you'll take people, let's take, you know, the traditional white American male, let's say he's 45 years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. This guy would totally believe in hiring a sports psychologist for mm -hmm. a baseball player, you know, because he, for some reason, he's got some hitch in his, you know, throwing motion or something. And he mm -hmm. used to be a hundred million dollar pitcher. And now he's having this mental problem or maybe a hitter, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, he can't keep psyching himself out. So they're like, yeah, let's get this guy a sports psychologist or something. Mm -hmm. However, when you start trying to talk about the psychological factors of race and gender and things like that, especially in the workplace and in, in society in general, it's all of a sudden that's yeah, just liberal nonsense that they're trying yeah. to push at universities or something. Um, but there's just, it's, it's a very, I think, complex situation. And, um, you know, it's they're, they're not simple issues to fix, but I think that when you said that in your in your previous interview that I saw, mm -hmm. um, 
I, that's the first time I really thought about how that feeling, because I've been thinking a bit about belonging because there was this um, mm. professor from, I think he's from Curacao, and he was mm -hmm. uh, doing a debate with the Dutch professor. They were talking about colonization and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but he was talking about this feeling that for people of lands that were colonized, okay, your, your country has no opportunity. There's no, there's no money there. You have to go to a place that has some mm. opportunity. So let's say that your country was colonized by the Netherlands. You think, okay, how about I go to the Netherlands? I mm -hmm. speak a little Dutch, you know, there's, there should be a little, you know, a little leeway maybe for me to make some, make some, make some room there for myself or something. But then you get there and you don't feel like you belong. Mm -hmm. Like you, you never really feel welcome. You always mm -hmm. feel like people are either pitying you or they're mm -hmm. just kind of patronizing, patronizing you. But um, you never really feel like you belong. Mm -hmm. And what he said is that's all people really want to feel, is they want to feel like Absolutely. they belong. And I think that, that this idea of belonging is one that most people, I'm kind of a little bit, I don't want to say I'm tired of the whole white privilege narrative, but I am tired of how lazy people are getting with like mm. just blaming white people for this, this, and that. Like It's not my fault if I walk into a store and I don't get harassed by somebody because I'm white. I shouldn't walk out of the store and apologize because I wasn't harassed. Mm. However, it's not right that people are harassed because of the color of their skin so I think that one element of white privilege is you really don't realize how good you had it you know like the belonging yeah. the you know the welcome feeling that you get when you immigrate to another country things like that mm -hmm. and so as a male you know mm -hmm. it's the same thing as the white privilege deal of it's I've never realized how comfortable it was to walk into a room when I'm at a networking event and everybody's a guy I never looked and thought oh my gosh there's so many men here and then felt intimidated of course I felt intimidated like everybody <laughs> does but not because of them being men mm -hmm. so now you're asking women to like do more right they have to work even harder yeah. and I think a lot of people don't realize the um, you know the situation that that I think protected classes in a way, uh, the yeah. situation that they're in because the deck is stacked against them. Wow. I'm not even sure how to, how to even approach that was a, that was a big topic. Um, because you have, yeah, you're talking about like white, white privilege, but also, you know, incorporating sort of the gender dynamic. Um, yeah, look, I am not somebody who, um, um, feels that, you know, men, um, should apologize. White men yeah. should, should apologize because of the sort of status quo. But the the thing is, and you you just explained it. Um, I think it needs to be acknowledged mm. by men, by white men, that there are disparities uh, out there when it comes to women or or minorities. That um, that needs to be acknowledged. That that there's a starting line, and not everybody is on the starting line right. for different things. That, you know, just growing up Great equality. Point. You know. If you acknowledge that and and you work to fix some of the issues. So, for example, if you're somebody who sits on an executive board of a company, you look around you and you see some people, you know, people who look just like you, you know, they're, they're, they're white men, you know, you have an obligation, I feel, to diversify that, to make steps internally in your company to um, have more diversity, whether it's, you know, with gender or with race. And um, th that's something that I feel that, need, you know, that should be done more by, by, by white men. Um, but indeed, there's, I feel that as women, and as minorities, we have to work harder. Um, there's, there's, if you're talking about women, like there's, um, I think it's called man speak, you know, <laughs> in meetings, in meetings, and oh, I've seen some videos like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, where it's this sort of, you know, you get mansplained, you know, yeah. to, you know, in, in, in that's, that's a, that's a big thing. I remember, I remember, um, in my previous jobs, I would always um, make a point to raise my hand and say something because a lot of women don't they're they're very kind of you know they they most time they they feel like um they they don't have anything to contribute or when they do sometimes they get you know sort of talked talked down or again there's that mansplaining or maybe they had an idea and then like two minutes later somebody else a white man you know has you know the, an idea that like, that's a that's a great point and just like <laughs> what you know what is this um but i think you know for 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 women and again you know for minorities you know there is this pressure to to work harder you know work harder just because of the color of our skin that's that's the part that for me um th th that that gets me yeah yeah no it's i'm glad that we're having this discussion because i think it's something that um People need to put themselves in other people's shoes more often. And I think that, um, yeah. you know, you really do have to, of course, you're going to talk to some people and they're going to tell you their story and it's just going to sound like bullshit and you're not going to have any sympathy for them. That's going to happen. But there's a lot of people out there with good stories, good experiences that will change your yeah. mind if you just take a little time to step out of your comfort zone and kind of see mm -hmm. how the other side, I think, is, uh, is living and how they're feeling. And I think from all the stuff over the past year of, you know, Black Lives Matter to now the, the election and these yeah. kind of things, it's like everybody is 
on different sides of things, but I do see more and more people who are trying to reach out and say like, Hey, I may not agree with you, but I am trying to kind of figure out like where you're coming from so that Absolutely. hopefully we can inject some, re- you know, reality into this situation and then, you know, come up yeah. with something. Yeah. Because I think, you know, if, if, if you and I were to walk into a room somewhere, you know, um, if, of course, depending on where we are, but we'll have different experience. We'll leave that room with different experiences. And um, I, I remember the, a small story in, in, in Idaho in law school. It was like a, a weekend. I would go to the mall and just walk around. I was like, I'm, I'm, I don't want to study anymore. And I would just like walk around. I remember the first time I got followed by a security guard. Mm. Uh, and this was in a perfume store. And um, it was so weird to me. I hadn't I had an experience before. And I heard, and of course, I read a lot of stories, you know, about uh, stereotyping, you know, and um um, I, it never happened before. It was like winter in Idaho. I had like my down coat on. I had like my beanie on. I didn't have any makeup on. And I just wanted just to just get out of my apartment and just walk in the mall. And I remember like the, the security guard. I was like, okay, he's kind of, you know, walking in. And yeah, I, I see him. And I would keep seeing him. And he would start to get closer and closer. And I was like, I think... I was like thinking to myself, like I think he's following me, you know. So I would kind of like move in different different aisles, and like he he would be there. And for me, it was a, it was so interesting because I never experienced that before. I know again, like I would hear stories from like my my you know colleagues or my classmates in, in you know, college, and they would tell me their experience. And I for some reason I was just like, no, you know, you guys, uh, that's a bizarre story. No, that's that's not possible. But when it happened to me, it made me realize, you know, that, that, wow, like this is, I almost kind of had a laugh at it. Cause number one, I was like, I'm more educated than, than he knows. Like, does he know like I'm in law school? You know, does he know that like, I, you know, all these things, you know? And for me, it was just, you know, this realization of, wow, putting myself in someone else's shoes and actually experiencing it, that really made a difference for me. So I always try to look at other people's, um, experiences you know before I, I i started working with refugees i i never met one yeah i worked as a lawyer and i a lot of what i did was like working on um you know research and, and case law and whatnot um but i never really worked on refugee law and so i'm actually quite ashamed of this um during the influx um during the influx there was um uh, you see you saw a lot of the head, headlines um um, the refugee crisis that you know Europe is is being invaded, mm-hmm. and I remember going to like the the Christmas markets and feeling scared because I thought you know that there would be like a terrorist attack you know because of the influx of refugees, and um, I you know I, I'm really quite ashamed of that. And so when I met women um, who were refugees, I started to hear their stories and I felt so humbled by 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 them and so um, in all of their strength and. Um, but I started to think about myself, like if I'm, if what my experience was with thinking about these particular group of people and having all these ideas, like again, you know, like stereotyping and they're, you know, coming from poverty and they're like, they're terrorists. If I had that experience and I'm, I'm really educated, highly educated, what does the average person think about a refugee? And, um, I try to advocate as much as I, as I can go out in the community meet someone who has a refugee background, take them out for coffee. Their story will change your life. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, this stuff is always like when it's just some academic foreign concept to you, it's so much more easy. It's so much easier to have an opinion. Mm-hmm. Like when talking about immigration, right? I mean, I'm an immigrant in the Netherlands. I've been here. Uh, March will be five official years when mm-hmm. then I can apply for permanent residence and stuff like that. And yeah. now going through an immigration process, messing things up, having to meet deadlines, having to beg when you, you know, fuck something up. And mm-hmm. like, no, please let me stay. Yeah, it yeah. gives you so much more empathy for people in the U.S. Yes. going through the same thing when before if you live your entire life in texas you're a native you don't have to worry about any of this stuff then it's like oh if they can't follow the laws and if they can't do the this and that then they don't deserve to be here and yeah it's like it's a lot harder than you think (laughs) (laughs) yeah i'm going through the the, the same experience and yeah it gave me some appreciation for you know for um people in uh, immigrants the united states and you know unfortunately we have a, a lot of immigrants who are undocumented and they especially with the trump administration oh so horrible the um the the policies that were in place you know where they had to hide and they were you know ice was like going to their workplace or looking for them at their home and you know some of them being sick but feel like they felt like they couldn't go to the hospital because they were gonna get you know arrested by ice and being taken back to to mexico there was I mean, it's not like that in the Netherlands. I don't want to say that, but it's it, it just kind of you know this whole immigration process really was a, was an eye opener for me. I have a few questions about that which I want to ask you, but first, can we take a quick break? I was going to say uh, yeah because um, let's let's do that. Let me know when you're. 
Yeah, we'll just go because ahead and stop right now. You'll look back at this podcast because you're going to do like 500 million of them. Oh, and then you're man. just going to be like, yeah, that one was not the Christina. That was like the worst because you're going to learn so, so much. Like, that's the best one that's ever because <laughs> it was the first one. <laughs> Guys, you can obviously tell that we're back. Um, we had to take a quick break. But um, so we have about, I think, oh, we have about like, six, six minutes. OK, yeah. um, so one question and then we'll get out of here, basically, because I did want to ask you because you kind of have some expertise on this. And let me just set the stage, which is that. So with the immigration uh, stuff that's been going on in the U.S., right, a couple of things. One is that you have a lot of people who are, you know, they're being caught at the border. They're being separated mm -hmm. from their families, stuff like that. And then the Trump administration claimed that, um, you know, Obama actually started that. So, you know, we're not the we're not the evil people doing whatever. And then you have the whole aspect of people saying, well, they're doing this to try to discourage, you know, illegal immigrants from coming across the border mm -hmm. and, you know, doing this. And so if we... And you know, there's some evidence that it worked. Some people say it doesn't matter because of the humanitarian aspect. And then you also, in your in one of your previous interviews, you just um, mentioned that there were quite a few things that the Trump administration did that were, mm -hmm. you know, kind of terrible. And so I just wanted to kind of yeah get your uh, expertise on that just to find out because yes, as an immigrant over here, you know, I do have a you know kind of I would like to know what's going on in the U.S. Yeah, so um, so you're talking about you know immigration. I think that what's what's happening right now. Well, if you look at the, the Trump administration, I think in 2016 he implemented a, a travel ban on um, people from coming uh, from se from seven Muslim majority countries that eventually increased to 11, and um, that's sort of how one of his um, one of the worst policies he had. Um, but later he was actually separating families at the at the border, and um, the Biden administration is now working to reunite. Um, families together. Um, he's not creating new law. He's just fixing bad policy. Um, you know, politics is is, is funny. Um, um, I don't agree with a lot of uh, well, well, some of the Obama administrative um, administration policies. Um, I think he was a great president, but there are some that I, I didn't agree with. Um, but you have to kind of look at like you know what's happened with uh, Trump, which was terrible, which is real, just morally wrong. Like you don't. Put children in cages. You know that's just morally wrong. So, but did wrong. he start that, or did the? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, yeah, and and and, and you know, in separating separating families. I mean, that was um, that was one thing, but also just this aggressive immigration reform, where you know he was empowering ICE to to go to find people. You know, on my for myself, like if I was driving, you know, I mean, they, they could they can pull me over and say, show me your papers. <laughs> Yeah. Because I was, you know, just by the color of my skin. In Arizona, for sure, they can do that. Yeah, yeah, crazy, right? And so there was, like, I, I, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of, like, humanitarian issues and human rights issues, I think that everyone should have um, uh, an opportunity to find a better life. You know, you're seeing a lot more of that because of envi uh, environmental disasters. You're seeing a lot of um, environmental refugees who are living in areas, for example, there's no water. Yeah. You know, they're they're moving. They they because they California cuts it off and I won't yeah. let it go down there. So um, yeah. <laughs> so it's it, this is a complicated question and there's there's lots to to consider. But I think that we're heading in the right direction uh, with the Biden administration. Just number one by fixing bad policy. So can you be specific about any of the policy that maybe uh, was bad that's being fixed? Well, right. It was. It was as I mentioned right now. It was the um, separating from uh, the families at the at the border, um, the trauma that's happened because of the separation. Um, some children, they can't they, they can't find their parents. Mm. So the parents are like, you know. So now there's just this aggressive search to find them and to reunite them. But you know, the parents are are they, they can't find them. They, I I wouldn't doubt that they're not coming forward voluntarily because they're you know they they're 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 scared there's this element of fear so that's 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 um already i think the first 11 days of the biden biden administration he's working to fix that and to reunite yeah. the the families but he's also relaxing um the policies on uh, for ice you know and, and for um them to be so aggressive by by you know going to workplaces or going to people's homes to and so to that's them. that's the thing the the ice deportations a lot um, of um the kind of justification for that is that they were only going to do that for criminals you're talking yeah. about like ms-13 and people like that that they're just going to become basically like navy seals going after these people but then yeah. it's not just them that they're being so aggressive with you're saying it's just normal people who normal are people it's also um daca there was um, yeah. um a, a very strong case so um there's a group of people called dreamers and uh, these are people who are do undocumented who came to the united states with their parents maybe and they're just like me they, they speak english you know they, they they've never been to mexico i've never been to mexico but they 
they were in uh, one of the policies of the Trump administration was to deport them back back to Mexico. But they were like, I've never I've never yeah. been to Mexico. You know, like I've, that's not my home. I'm a, I'm American. So now that's being that's being reversed. And, and you know, g- give them an opportunity. You know, if they're in the they're in the United States and you know they want to go to college, they've been there their whole life. If they work, let them pay taxes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let them pay taxes. Let let them you know uh, do the work that. Yeah, I'm sorry, but the majority of Americans don't want to do like yep. no, work in the true. fields yeah. and you know. When, Watch yeah. some of those documentaries on Netflix and stuff about how hard some of those jobs are. If there's Crazy. nobody lining up for some of those jobs that they're, you know, um, kind of scaring us all on Fox News that they're, you know, taking all of our great jobs. Um, we only have basically one minute left, so okay. I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for coming and being, like I said, the first uh, guest for episode 1.0. Um, and You're I just, welcome. yeah, if you could maybe give people a way to, to contact you, follow you, anything that you want to tell them to do to get in touch or what you would like them to do after this episode. Yeah, t- uh, take a look at our website at uh, shematters.nl. Um, take a look and you can see what we do. We also have some great videos on our YouTube channel. You can you can find out more about what we do there. Um, um, we also, because we have a foundation, we have a global giving platform. We're able to donate to the foundation, which will empower um, uh, women with refugee background with those soft skills workshops and the mentorships. So take a look at it. It all starts with our website. We have a bunch of links there. So um, yeah, at, at a minimum, follow us on social media because this is a crazy ride, man. And I'm 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 just one of the lucky uh, few who gets to you know live her passion through her work and you know if I can bring as many people as I can on this journey you know I think that would be great. It's a great story and I was happy to be able to help tell yeah. it. Yeah. So thanks again Thank for coming. Thank you. All this right. was amazing. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind.